Hello, I'm Jimmy Kemp, president of the Jack Kemp Foundation, and today it's a pleasure to introduce the Kemp Oral History Congressional Staff Symposium. Um, we've got many of the uh, staffers from Dad's congressional uh, tour of duty from 1971 through 1989, um, and this is a, a special time for me because uh, I remember all these folks from my childhood, which I hope doesn't offend them, but uh, we're really pleased to have uh, Sharon Zalaska and Randy Teague, John Mueller and Bill Schneider uh, at this morning's panel. Um, and we really are grateful for Mort Kondracki, uh, who's done a great job with the Kemp Oral History and providing a valuable resource to people who are interested in my father's legacy of uh, leading the supply side economic movement um, and rebuilding our country uh, during the Reagan administration. Uh, so it's a privilege to introduce Mort and the Kemp Congressional Staff Symposium. Thank you. This is the first of two uh, staff symposia. We're at the Longworth House Office Building. Today is September 19th, 2011, and I am Morton Kondracki. Um, so first, what I'd like you to do is introduce yourselves. Uh, tell us what your dates of uh, employment at uh, Jack Kemp's office were, what your position was, how you got your job, and what was your first impression of Jack and the place? We'll start with Randy and then go to Bill. Uh, I'm Randall Teague, and I had the pleasure of serving from 1973 to 1979 as Jack's uh, chief of staff, then called administrative assistant uh, and legislative director. Uh, I had met Jack in the 1970 campaign, which was his first campaign for Congress. Uh, I was involved, as was another person on this panel, uh, in the Buckley for Senate campaign in New York. Uh, and the intersection of Youth for Kemp in Buffalo and Youth for Buckley throughout the state brought us together for one time. I think I actually met him then and did not see him again until 1973. Uh, I was in the executive office of the president, and you will remember the summer of 1973 was a very uh, uh, discombobulated time within that office. Um, and Jack called me on the telephone on the recommendation of Senator Buckley's Chief of Staff, David Jones, and said that he was looking for a new administrative assistant, uh, a person that combined two qualities of experience that were impossible to obtain in any one person. Uh, he was desperate to have somebody that really knew public works issues because of his district on Lake Erie, but he also needed somebody with a background in tax uh, it so happened that I had been the Republican clerk of the House Committee on Public Works, uh, where we handled those water projects, uh, and I had a law degree in tax law. Uh, I did pull together five or six resumes for him, uh, but I put mine on top. Uh, and uh, Jack called me and he said, I need to interview you, and I said, that's fine. Where should we meet? He said, in the members gallery overlooking the house and I thought this would be an interesting interview because you're not allowed to speak in the members gallery of the house. Uh, that was on a Tuesday night. Uh, he offered me the job, asked me when I was ready to go. I said, how about tomorrow morning? Uh, and he said, well, I need at least a week. So I started the following Monday and did that through 1979. It was an exciting place to be because let me guarantee you, you could work 16 hours a day and not resent it because Jack was working 17 hours a day. Okay, Bill Schneider. Well, th uh, thank you, Mort. And uh, I uh, also got to know uh, Jack uh, during the 1970 campaign. I uh, was uh, working for uh, ca then candidate Jim Buckley and uh, joined his staff when he became uh, a U.S. Senator uh, in uh, January of 71. Uh, uh, Jack was uh, very interested in uh, national security issues, which was the area I specialized, uh, but his uh, committee service uh, didn't overlap with uh, uh, committees that had jurisdiction over national security matters. But nevertheless, during the period between uh, uh, January of 71 and January of 77, when I uh, joined his uh, staff as his appointee on the House Defense Appropriations Committee, I did provide him with uh, uh, briefings and, and material. Uh, he, he was a voracious um, 
reader of uh, almost anything that uh, came up, and uh, during the, uh, that period was uh, one of particularly intense conservative criticism of the um, uh, Nixon-Kissinger policy of detente, and, and Jack generally subscribed to it. Uh, 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 Jim Buckley was the beneficiary of many of the same uh, political trends or exploiting the political demography of New York State at, at the time where uh, many of the people who would ultimately become Reagan Democrats were uh, moving their affiliation uh, to Republicans because the uh, Republicans like Jim Buckley and Jack Kemp uh, stood for uh, an assertive foreign policy, a strong national defense, uh, a, a pro-growth economic policy, and low taxes, all of which w uh, were increasingly congruent to the electorate at that point. And so uh, when uh, Jim Buckley was defeated for uh, re-election in, in uh, 1976, he, losing to uh, uh, that subsequently Senator Moynihan, uh, uh, Jack was uh, uh, appointed to the uh, Subcommittee on Defense of uh, Defense Appropriations and contacted me in December of 76 and asked me to, to, to join the, the staff, which I did in, in uh, January of 77 and served uh, there until uh, January of 81 when I um, uh, served uh, as associate director at the Office of Management and Budget for National Security and International Affairs in the uh, first Reagan administration. Okay, Sharon. My name is Sharon Zalaska, and I started working for Jack on uh, June 1st, 1977. I got the call from Jack on April um, the 16th, 1977, to come for an interview. That date is important because it was the day after Income Tax Day, and he had gotten a letter from his uh, accountant saying that if he didn't do something with his accounts and his finances, that he could be in deep trouble by the next year. So he was out looking for somebody who could take care of his personal uh, affairs and um, all of the uh, accounts for the House of Representatives. So I started June 1st, 1977, and was with him until February of 97. I'm the longest serving staff member on his staff. Um, I was originally there as a personal assistant and then as Randy says you know um, your titles changed depending on what he wanted you to do at the time so uh, I kept that title until 1988 when we went to HUD yeah. um, as Randy said also it was a very very exciting office he wasn't very well known at the time other than being a football player that's how I knew him um, and, uh, but he, he worked so hard. None of us left the office until he left at the end of the day. He, he was tireless and you, you wanted to give him everything. You wanted to give your all to him because of that, so. John? Uh, my name is John Mueller. Uh, I work uh, for Jack uh, from January 1979 through the end of 1988. Um, I had been a, um, a, um, an editor and reporter for a local daily newspaper in New Jersey, uh, Morristown, uh, later the Morris County Daily Record. Um, I um, was writing editorials and book reviews. Um, Jude Winiski, um, who played a large role in the supply side movement, uh, lived in, in Morristown and introduced himself to me. He wanted me to, uh, wanted the newspaper the, uh, to endorse Jeffrey Bell, who was running for uh, Senate against uh, uh, in, in 1978. And um, the, the paper didn't do uh, endorsements at the statewide or, or higher level, so I couldn't help him out. But he had just written a book called The Way the World Works. <clears throat> and my future wife-to-be and I had started a book review column. And I um, reviewed The Way the World Works. And I was pretty, pretty much uh, converted to supply side uh, as a result. I was um, hired as press secretary to um, Jeffrey Bell in his Senate campaign. When he lost, uh, I was unemployed on, um, on election day, and, um, but uh, Jude recommended me to Jack, and uh, so I got the call to come down to uh, Washington uh, to interview with Jack at his office, and we hit, him, hit it off right away. Jack was looking for a speechwriter. Um, uh, I, that was basically the position I held for the next eight years. 
Um, though, as uh, Sharon said, you wound up doing almost anything. Um, I, for one brief month, I was actually the uh, chief of staff. Uh, but uh, I, I think Sharon recognized first that I'm just uh, not suited for that role. And uh, so I, I happily um, became simply Jack's speechwriter. And uh, that, later on, I backed my way into becoming his economist because I had I'm not afraid of numbers, having started out as a physics physics major, so I um, uh, backed my way into numbers crunching. But uh, I filled various roles, uh, mostly as the um, economic counsel to the House Republican Conference, of which Jack was chairman from uh, January uh, 1981 through uh, 1987. So, June go ahead. gotten commissions, because that's how <laughs> I got to work for Jack also. He, I knew him at the American Enterprise Institute, and he's the one that gave Jack my name to uh, come and interview for him. So uh, uh, just briefly, what do you think uh, are the major accomplishments uh, of, of Jack Kemp's during your time there? What would you say you accomplished? And were there, were there any errors that you think? Were there, any, were there any mistakes or failures? Randy? Well, that's a, an extremely good question because it summarizes Jack's service in Congress and then to some degree after he left Congress, the greatest achievement was to be a member of Congress, not on the House Committee on Ways and Means that had jurisdiction over tax, uh, but to seize a lot of inchoate ideas within the Republican Party as to how to reduce the tax burdens uh, upon businesses at the beginning and then upon people as individual taxpayers uh, as this moved on. Uh, when we first began in 1973 working on the tax issue, uh, the focus was primarily on credits, deductions, et cetera. It was also on reducing the burden on business. What Jude Winitsky brought to us, as did Arthur Laffer, Bob Bartley, and other people, was a movement from focusing on those burdens to focusing on the burdens of tax rates upon individual taxpayers. And so legislatively, it moved from a very narrow piece of legislation uh, focused on investment tax credits, et cetera, to what ultimately became the Reagan tax cuts during the first Reagan administration. And the achievement of that resting with Jack, that he kept this issue alive amongst many people who felt that reduced tax rates would, be, would mean reduced revenues to the government rather than increased revenues to the government. And he was able to do that into the Reagan uh, campaign and then into the Reagan presidency. What an incredible accomplishment. Yeah. Any, any mistakes, errors? Well, I think it took us a while to realize uh, what uh, was needed to build political support. Uh, there were members of the House Committee on Ways and Means who were extremely influential within the House who were quite resentful of Jack as not being a member of that committee, working so visibly in the public media on tax issues. There were others, and for the shorthand, let's call them Eisenhower Republicans, who felt that the responsibility of the Republican Party was to raise taxes to pay for uh, Democratic spending programs. Uh, and uh, they uh, had real trouble seeing what the underlying economic principles and so forth were under this. I think we have to remember that during the off season when Jack was in the NFL, AFL, uh, became the NFL, uh, he was a special assistant to Governor Reagan during those off seasons. And he really uh, totally uh, brought to Washington Reagan's views on how to approach economies, uh, California being the largest economy in the United States. And the thing that was so marvelous about Jack was that he had these boxes of press releases, statements, speeches, and so forth from Governor Reagan. And he could reach right into that box, 14 inches back, and pull out the speech he was looking for. And so he brought these Reagan ideas into the Republican Party almost a decade before Reagan had the control of the Republican Party. So, so Reagan was his, his intellectual um, stimulator? Uh, I, I, I mean, don't know if you'd call it an intellectual stimulator. It was a combination of things, certainly policy stimulator. I call it policy stimulator. 
but also his sense of moral courage that no matter what you might say about people long ago, the Churchills of the world and so forth that had great moral courage, that Ronald Reagan was a person of the same period of time that had the moral courage to do the right thing. And Jack felt that he could try this, uh, to help this Republican Party do the right thing. So what, what was it about Reagan that he so admired? I mean, what, were there specific things that he pointed his finger at? I think political courage as much as anything else. Uh, California at the time that Reagan became governor there was, you know, not totally, but it was predominantly a democratic state uh, based upon the uh, principles of the Democratic Party. Uh, the labor unions were gaining control of the state and things like that. Jack would never attack a labor union because he had been head of a labor union as a professional athlete. But what Jack saw in Reagan was articulation of public policy issues and the moral courage to see them out, the political courage to see them out. Um, and I think that's what he was trying to bring to this. Uh, Jack, like anyone, had a, 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 a day that lived with the past and tried to predict the future. And so Jack came to town wanting to be part of that House Republican establishment, chowder and marching and those kinds of things that were the inner club. And yet at the same time, he had the courage to be outside of that uh, club structure, to be a catalyst for new ideas. And much of the work that he had to do, you said, what mistakes did we make? A mistake we made was that we did not perceive early enough that part of the battle to achieve reduced tax rates was not a battle between Republicans and Democrats. It, for several years, was very much a battle within the Republican Party. Okay. Uh, Bill Schneider? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to add just a few points to, um, uh, to Randy's uh, observations. I had been doing some work for uh, uh, Governor Reagan after he had retired from California and was pursuing the, the presidency. I had uh, written some <clears throat> or contributed to, to uh, speeches and uh, provided some background briefings. And I think the, perhaps the most enduring uh, contribution uh, Jack has made uh, certainly to uh, uh, President Reagan, but uh, perhaps to public policy has has been the, the his success in persuading uh, Reagan that the way to uh, to go was uh, a focus on uh, uh, reducing taxes. And it, the, I, I think uh, Reagan recognized the ingenuity in the concept because it it created a, a virtuous circle of stimulating economic development which uh, produced revenues which uh, allowed you to uh, uh, diminish the uh, share of uh, uh, government that was uh, accounted for by uh, uh, federal activity. And this uh, created the, the opportunity in, uh, that uh, subsequently evolved in the Reagan administration where um, you were able to talk in practical terms about uh, meeting the uh, basic needs of the society, including uh, uh, national defense and safety net, but reducing the share uh, that accounted for by government of, of the national income. And his, his um, uh, persuasiveness in, in persuading President Reagan, uh, then candidate Reagan, to adopt this approach over all of the objections that came from, as Randy suggested, inside the Republican Party uh, was, was really a, a testimony and, and sh showed about, how much... What about in your area, in, in, the, in the defense foreign policy area? I mean, what would you say that Major Jack's major accomplishments were? Well, well I, I think it was integrated with his, his views on um, uh, taxes. He, he would have had, uh, in, in the uh, uh, current season, where uh, it's, it's seen that, that in order to uh, allow the economy to recover, you have to have to cut uh, national defense. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Jack would uh, uh, argue uh, now, as he uh, as he certainly did then, that w what you needed was a, a pro-growth economic policy that would that would produce the revenues. He was very sensitive to the uh, threats posed to U.S. interest in the uh, in the 1970s, just as we have uh, profound threats. Uh, facing us today and recognized that those had to be 
uh, engaged, but he saw uh, the engine of economic growth as being the driver that created the resources for national defense. And, and so I think uh, the, the ability to um, bring together the, uh, uh, the shared interest that, say, national defense has with economic growth was a very compelling uh, set of arguments and found uh, uh, a very uh, persuaded audience in President Reagan and uh, the leading players in his cabinet. Mm -hmm. uh, so, did, any errors? Any? Well, well I, uh, maybe it's uh, it was an impossible uh, aspiration. But when I served in OMB, I worked for uh, 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 Dave Stockman, who was at, uh, uh, during the congressional service. So they were uh, good friends. Uh, Stockman had an encyclopedic. Uh, knowledge of the federal budget and uh, 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 federal revenues, and the idea of converging good policy with with detailed knowledge is uh, perhaps utopian. But uh, I think uh, uh, Jack chose not to apply himself to the details, and instead focused on the uh, uh, the policy. I think in that respect, he's much more like Reagan than than say uh, Stockman or other politicians who focused on the details. Well, just, just let me follow up on that. Uh, did Stockman and Kemp had a big falling out, right. basically. I mean, yes. They were close friends right. in Congress, and then Stockman becomes right. head of OMB and declares Kemp Roth to be trickle-down economics and a big fraud, basically. So yeah. what, what, what happened after that? Uh, well, the, I think the, the, the main issue, as I recall it, was that uh, uh, Stockman was convinced that uh, even though Republicans talked about uh, um, uh, reducing uh, federal expenditure, in fact, they were not prepared to do so. And uh, uh, as a result, he, he felt that the, um, uh, that the Kemp-Roth proposition would lead to high budget deficits uh, forever. This uh, you know, proved not to be uh, sustained uh, as, as the subsequent recovery showed, but it, but the uh, uh, the way in which uh, uh, Stockman promoted this view in in uh, in uh, the um, his uh, brief uh, period of uh, public exposure as as director uh, really separated he and and uh, Jack, and uh, that uh, led to a falling out. So I mean, you were you were basically the, the staff organizer. Uh, I gather, and you, and you found it in a wreckage when, when you arrived, and then what happened? Well, not so much the staff. I mean, I they mean, were all doing their thing, but his financial things and his uh, administrative paperwork and things were in a disarray. And I can remember after the first month sitting in the middle of his office on a Saturday afternoon crying my eyes out <laughs> because I didn't understand why I left my other job. Because <laughs> Um, but I followed my own rule, which was always give a new job a year, and I did, and of course I went on to be 20 years, and it was, it was just a, a great experience. I do remember one piece of advice that Randy gave me, which was, um, there will be days when he'll do something really stupid, <laughs> and you'll wonder why in the world he's doing that, but he will always land on his feet. Do you remember telling me that? Yeah. And he did. I mean, he, he just had a remarkable... Uh, way about him. Uh, he, w he was very disorganized himself. He had papers everywhere. Um, you, you wondered what was in that stack, but he knew what was in that stack, just like the Reagan papers. Um, but he just, um, he, was, he, w he could be very disorganized himself, but everything was right up here. He knew exactly what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. and to, were, there, just, were there any what, what were some of the, the, the times when you thought he'd really made a big mistake that he landed on his feet about? Um, I, well, I can't think of anything right offhand. Um, <laughs> a couple of things that Jude Wininsky was were always trying to get him to do um, didn't always pan out the way the staff, the rest of the staff thought they would. But um, I can't remember anything off how, how in, in how much detail did Jude Wininsky get into running the office? He was... <laughs> Jack spoke to him a lot. I mean, they uh -huh. were just on the phone constantly, constantly. Um, and he was always um, telling people to come in to see him, make this appointment. You know, he, was, he wanted him to get ideas from a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he did, he did, he was at the Kemp home probably two nights a week for dinner. Um, Jimmy can probably attest to that. Um, 
he, he had a lot of influence over Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, so John, I mean, clearly tax reform and, and uh, Camp Roth were, the, were signal accomplishments right. during your period, and we've discussed those at the Miller Center uh, in detail. So what, what else would you say were the major accomplishments, and, and also uh, were, there any, were, were there any mistakes along the way? I just wanted to add to what Sharon said. Uh, I, uh, Jack did have his foibles, but I, I've, I've always been struck at how he chose uh, the, the people to work for him uh, as if uh, actively to counteract those weaknesses, that he would hire a Sharon Zalassa to get his finances in order. And uh, he, um, he had a great relationship with the people that he, that he trusted. Um, he, when, he, uh, when he wrote speeches for him, he would often mark them up, uh, and what I understood, I think, um, is that he didn't want you to take them literally. What he was saying, there is something wrong with this passage, fix it. And I think a lot of other speech writers came along and took them literally and said, you know, take Jack's language, and often that wasn't exactly the right language, but he was always right that there was something wrong with that passage. And uh, so I, I just, just wanted to add that. I, he, had, he took got the big picture, and I think his, um, his sense of tactics from the football field translated very well into the Congress, which is a very fluid situation. Uh, uh, every member of Congress has to be his own Secretary of State, his own Secretary of Defense, and uh, so you could find yourself doing almost anything. And Jack was great at, the, uh, at um, seeing changes on the field, as it were, as they were happening, and that's what made him a, a great... It's a good analogy. Um, and I think that the Reagan revolution could not have happened without both Jack in the Congress and Reagan at the, at the White House, because I don't think that Jack's skills, because of some of the weaknesses in, in administration that, that uh, Sharon mentioned, um, would have made him as, as Reagan-esque, say, as, as Reagan was. And so I think that it was a symbiotic relationship that made it work. Uh, Reagan saw what Jack had to offer, but Reagan also had the big picture uh, uh, at the time, he gave a, a great um, speech to CPAC in uh, January of 1977, in which he laid out his old strategy, except for the economic component. That was kind of like a placekeeper, and Jack and his Kemproth and the, the pro-growth um, strategy. Reagan made the CPAC. Reagan yeah, made the yeah. CPAC strategy. So he had the, the, the whole um, uh, view of things from defense, um, social policy, economic policy, um, he had it, it all um, sketched out, but he needed to put the, the Jack's ideas into the economic component. Right. So we know that we know that Jack was gave Reagan supply side economics as a as a theme. Do you do you share Randy's view that uh, that Reagan was some sort of an inspiration to Jack? Uh, there was a symbiotic relationship between them. Um, I think that. Um, Dave Smick, who was his uh, AA for a while, uh, wrote in a, uh, an article about that, uh, I think at the time of Jack's death, that uh, it was an uneasy relationship actually between Jack and Reagan. Uh, I think that Jack, it's, in some cases, was a sort of a burr under Reagan's saddle uh, and uh, um, pushing him f further than uh, he made up, he had wanted to go. I, I think that Reagan remarks in his autobiography and in his diaries that uh, on a couple of occasions, I think on the, on the occasion of um, um, one of those budget deals, there was supposed to be uh, $3 of spending tax for $1 of tax increase, and Jack was against this proposal. And I think Reagan says in his, his diary, which he puts in the autobiography, that Jack was being unreasonable. Well, as it turned out, <laughs> Jack was right about the fact that the tax increases would materialize, but not the spending cuts. Um, but uh, it, was, it was not always an easy relationship, but I think it was a fruitful one uh, for both of them. Uh, Mark, you, can I? You, you were in the, in the Reagan White House uh, and yeah. in, in the Reagan administration. So how was he regarded by the Reaganites? Uh, well, his, uh, at the uh, front end of the administration that led up to the, uh, the, the passage of the Kemp Roth bill and, and the, uh, the, the budget deal that worked with uh, Tip O'Neill was, was really uh, a, a decisive um, inflection point in the, in the uh, Reagan administration, and uh, um, I think at, at that stage Jack was uh, was seen as a, a crucial player in being able to get this to work across uh, uh, both houses of 
of the Senate getting uh, the president uh, in support of it because uh, at the time the Republicans controlled the Senate but not the House. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Jack's uh, skills at uh, being able to recruit uh, Democrats for uh, this kind of legislation was, uh, was decisive in, in, in getting it passed. Once that, that had, had happened, uh, of course, the economy was still uh, in a recession. It bottomed out uh, basically during the 82 congressional elections, and uh, th there was increasing tension. That's when you were getting the uh, uh, budget forecast from OMB that um, uh, uh, suggested continued uh, uh, budget deficits. They, they did not use dynamic economic models in, in OMB, so there wasn't much um, uh, feedback reported from, from the growth in the economy. As, as a consequence, the news was very grim. Uh, uh, Director Stockman wanted to uh, take down the uh, uh, defense program and, and s several other initiatives, which led to actually a sequence of uh, uh, trimmings uh, uh, that led up to this uh, bigger uh, tax and spend uh, transaction that John was referring to earlier. So I, I think uh, over time, uh, uh, as uh, John suggested, uh, um, uh, uh, Jack was seen as goading the, uh, the White House on, on issues that were uh, uh, President Reagan uh, felt that uh, he needed to make a deal. And, uh, and from your end, what, what did they have to say about Jack? Uh, in the uh, in the White House, in the White House. Well, well, they, they uh, I think they were increasingly uh, irritated with his uh, um, dogged pursuit of um, uh, uh, to, uh, re reductions and any specifics of um, what they said. Uh, uh, they were not complimentary. <laughs> <laughs> Who in particular? Um, uh, say uh, uh, Jim Baker and. Uh, uh, s several of the people, especially those who had been associated with the uh, Bush um, Bush won um, election campaign in 1980, there were, <clears throat> there were uh, f uh, fault lines that had remained in the Reagan White House uh, uh, between Bush factions, for want of a better term, and, and uh, Reagan factions. And so some of those who were um, associated with the, the former uh, saw uh, Jack as, uh, as uh, a particularly uh, troublesome figure in, in... Troublesome, is that the language they used? Or uh, uh, that's the G-rated version <laughs> of it, yes. <laughs> well, uh, since you have to leave early, I just want to, let's, let's go, go to some other administrations, then we'll get into how the, how mm -hmm. the office operated and stuff. But, but during the Nixon years, mm -hmm. um, and during the Ford years, he was also at odds with uh, with the administration, right. largely over foreign policy. Right. right. So tell us about that and, and what the what the byplay was on both sides. It was over largely detente and. Uh, yes, uh, th it was uh, uh, a, t a time that I had the uh, privilege to have a, uh, interaction with him, even though I wasn't on his staff. I was working in the, the Senate at the time, but uh, the. Um, uh, because Jack's district had a, a lot of uh, people from Central Europe, especially from Poland. He had a p particularly um, uh, strong sympathy for uh, developments uh, in, in, uh, in the Soviet bloc. And uh, as a consequence, he, uh, he uh, read um, uh, uh, very avidly. As at, in the early 70s, it was the time when uh, uh, particularly, uh, Solzhenitsyn was um, still in the Soviet Union, very active as a as an intense uh, uh, critic of, of the uh, uh, the Soviet leadership and the whole process of détente. Uh, uh, Robert Conquest, Richard Pipes, other uh, academic specialists in in the U.S. Uh, Henry Jackson, as a, a senator who had, had promoted this, was uh, had. Um, uh, had an influence on Jack. He was he was very interested in it, and uh, so we uh, continued to study the uh, the question of uh, uh, how can we respond to détente. What are the alternatives uh, to it? And, and it had its um, uh, constructive impact. And I think uh, to, to see um, uh, President Reagan ultimately saying. Uh, rhetorically to Gorbachev to take down this wall was um, a, an illustration of the notion that uh, we should not accept the permanent division of, of Europe and the uh, U.S. foreign policies that we're obliged to 
uh, respect that division. And, and uh, uh, I think Jack was uh, an important player in the um, run-up to what ultimately became uh, uh, a, a policy commitment during the Reagan administration not to accept the division of uh, Europe and indeed uh, in, in areas that I had a small part in, in the, when I served in the government to begin to attack Soviet uh, power at its extremities in uh, Nicaragua and Afghanistan and in Africa. Uh, the, uh, the kind of um, uh, uh, public diplomacy campaign that uh, President Reagan uh, undertook so successfully uh, meshed very well with Jack's interest, as Randy suggested, in, in the ability to articulate uh, uh, a defense of uh, these kind of policy initiatives. So, so uh, d during this, uh, the 70s and the run-up to his uh, uh, subsequent service on the uh, Defense Appropriations Committee, where he got a lot of uh, first-hand information when uh, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, George Mahon was the, the chairman who had been the uh, 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 the first chairman of the Defense Appropriations Committee when it was established in, in 1949 was, uh, uh, was uh, particularly effective at uh, 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 getting good testimony before the committee and it, it, it opened Jack's eyes to a, a lot of the things that were going on and the, the consequences for U.S. interests of the way in which detente was being uh, conducted. So it, he f fused his uh, views on pro-growth with uh, a strong uh, so, defense policy. So, so what did he think about Henry Kissinger? He was uh, um, uh, antagonistic towards the, um, uh, the policies that he promoted. He felt that the, they were um, uh, sustaining uh, uh, Soviet power rather than weakening it and uh, uh, that he, he uh, believed, as, uh, as he often heard from his constituents who had family ties to Central Europe, that the Soviet Union had a much looser grip on uh, its uh, satellite states than uh, the, the detente policy would allow. And uh, uh, so I, I, I think it, it, uh, it, it persisted. Uh, uh, and when um, uh, uh, Kissinger uh, left the scene, he had uh, uh, a lot of different things to say about uh, foreign policy. But Jack then continued to be very interested in uh, uh, the, the way uh, detente was practiced by the Carter administration. He, he became a member of the um, uh, Congressional Review Panel that was set up under the Arms Control Act to monitor the uh, strategic arms limitation talks, as they were then, then called. He made a, a number of trips to Geneva to, uh, uh, to review the progress of the talks and became a, uh, a regular critic of the um, uh, of the arms control process, which was the, the main uh, flagship of uh, detente. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, dur during the Carter administration, famously, the defense budget was, uh, was reduced considerably right. post-Vietnam <coughs> and so right. on. So what, was Jack in favor of increasing defense budgets all the time? Uh, yes, and uh, um, he, uh, in, in the uh, defense appropriations process, you, you, you could not avoid um, encountering detail because uh, uh, Chairman Mahon would uh, take several weeks to go through a, a committee markup. And uh, so he got to look, uh, uh, look intently at all 3,000 line items in the uh, R&D uh, appropriation request. And it, but uh, even, even though he uh, was not a, a, te a technically inclined person, the, the drip feeding of uh, what was being done to, to taking the capability out of our um, uh, defense program that had been uh, accelerating during the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Carter administration it w was uh, coupled with his cr criticism of detente uh, uh, to uh, come up with a view that uh, the, the U.S. was being uh, undermined, and he, he fastened quickly onto the Reagan slogan of peace through strength, and it had a lot of uh, resonance, as I said, with his, uh, in parallel with his views on uh, pro-growth. Okay, um, let's go to how the the office was organized. Now, where was it exactly? Where where were your offices when during the seventies? Well, one thirty two Cannon. That's one thirty two Cannon, and and what what did it look like? 
of three offices, one the member's office, uh, the reception behind which was the chief of staff and the LD and the PR person, the and then the room. legislative shop uh, right next to it. It varied a little bit. But, you know, I think we have to pull something together here because John very well has stated uh, the relationship between Jack's professional football career and his political career. But I think you have to remember it wasn't just football, it was that Jack was the quarterback. And as the quarterback, he expected the other 43 players on the team to do what they were supposed to do. You had 43 staffers? No, 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 43, 44 people on the football team. Oh, I see. And so, you know, <laughs> Jack, you know, comes back from a trip, uh, and he expects that the LD has done his work, the LAs have done their work, the chief of staff's done his work, the defense appropriations uh, has done their work. And because the quarterback can't do it all. What the quarterback has is a playbook in his head. And we all know that a playbook in the head is only as good as the game begins, right? And then what happened over a period of six or seven years, of course, is that you're changing the playbook as to what you're trying to do in winning this game of getting a new recognition of a tax policy in the country and the enactment of that into statutes. And so when Jack, this image of Jack, uh, which I think is valid, but, you know, Jack comes back from being on the road for three or four days, and he empties his pockets. He turns over his files and so forth, and he expects people to then pick up turns all of that. Turns them over to who? Well, it depends. I mean, certainly he would turn a file over if it was uh, dealing with legislation or a speech or something like that to one person. Certainly if he's emptying his pockets or his wallet of receipts of expenditures he's had, that would go to the personal assistant. Um, and when Sharon came to the job, uh, I'm sure there had been nothing filed in months, if not since he began in Congress. Um, and I think in respect to the financial issues, it was not any impropriety. It's just that an accountant sitting there was given a box probably around April the 1st uh, and had to do everything by April the 15th or get an extension. And so you had receipts of actual expenditures and so forth, but you didn't know who was there and what they were and everything else. That's where staff becomes very important. And I think what eventually happened in that office is that much of that got it, certainly with respect to finances and so forth, got itself under control. But, you know, a member of Congress, you know, you expect to be in session on Thursday and Friday. The decision is made Wednesday night, you're not. All the scheduling changes and everything else. And so the frantic nature, frenetic nature of what was happening in that office on almost every day is why people had to do their very best to stay on top of things. Uh, because not in defense of somebody that may have not done their filing, but you usually do filing during a quiet period. And in the last 18 months, if there's never been a day that was a quiet period, those kinds of things get sloughed off. But I think the office, you know, rotated uh, around not only Jack as the member of Congress, because he was the only one that carried that title, and it was his office, but around the enormous amount of activity that was being generated. Staying on top of that was very different from most, I will say most, other congressional offices. Because he had so many balls in the air? He had so many balls in the air. And let's face it, I mean, you know, when a member comes to Congress, they obviously bring their past with them. Uh, they might have been in a state legislature, they might have been in the private sector, they might have been an attorney. But Jack brought the NFL with him into that office. And one of the exciting things about being in that office is from any given day, who was going to walk through that door. And if Pete Rozelle just walked through the door, you know, the schedule for the next hour went where you would expect it would have gone. And that was true with a lot of people that he had played with because Jack, having been head of the, the uh, union and so forth, he had many contacts that transcended just the team. Uh, so it was that kind of a life, the constituent services that had to be undertaken. Um, and of course, Jack spending much of his weekends and recesses and things like that within his constituency because Jack had a, a seat that had not been a Republican seat. Uh, Max McCarthy had held that seat, a member of the Democratic Party for a number of years. And so no matter what Jack's pluralities may have been, his majorities may have been, in each election cycle, he never took his constituency for granted. He never took his congressional district for granted. And so he would spend a lot of time there at the same time that he was in New York and Los Angeles and other places 
putting these elements of his economic policy together, but Jack was also building friendships with his colleagues in the House by appearing at speeches and dinners and luncheons and so forth for them. Sounds like a scrambling quarterback. That's exactly an excellent way to capture it. John, uh, what, 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 was it, what was the office organization like? I mean, how, how did it function? Well, you mentioned, uh, you asked where we were. Uh, when, when I arrived, we were at 2235 Rayburn, and we later moved to 2252. Uh, so he goes later. from Cannon to two offices in Rayburn, is that Three right? Three yeah, offices oh. in Rayburn. Yeah. We kept trying to get a bigger office, and we would go into the pool and pick a number and, you know, see if we could get a bigger office. We ended up in 2252, but we went from, I wasn't with him at Cannon, but then we went to 2244 Rayburn, then 2235, and then 2252. But in each case, the staff is sort of yeah, it was still cheek by jowl, out. is it? Well, we were. I think we had uh, three and sometimes four of us in the, the middle office in 2235. Mm -hmm. um, um, there was Lou Rotterman, who was the press secretary, in one corner. I think Phil was in another corner. I was uh, on the other side of the door from him. And I think, Sharon, you might have been in there for a while, though you're usually I out didn't in front. I there until 2252. Yeah. Um, so we were, there wasn't much room, but it was a great relationship among the staff. I mean, the fact that we still get, uh, we still keep up, uh, sh uh, most of the staffers in this room uh, meet for parties, you know, uh, years after the fact, and are each are godparents for each other's kids, and uh, it was just a great relationship, I think, among the staff, and it was the tone that Jack set, really. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard it said that uh, the, an effective leader um, has a lot of open channels for communication, but a single line of authority. I'd say that Jack had a lot of open channels for communication, but not a single line of authority. Uh, and I think it was the, it was the uh, camaraderie of the staff that really kept things together. That, well, know. how did you know what to do? Well, we communicated with each other because we knew mm -hmm. that sometimes Jack would give one person a job, all, you know, secretly and then he'd go and give somebody else the same job. So we learned eventually. Was that, was that to create creative tension no, or was it? No, I, I, don't, I don't know. It wasn't a malevolent <coughs> thing he did. He just wanted everybody to, to do the best they could, I guess. But we learned after a while to start talking to each other and instead of being secretive about it, we would talk to each other about it and we'd find out that we were doing double, double duty and then we'd, we'd just work together. We, it was a great staff. I, 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 can't, I can't say it uh, more strongly that we were a great staff. Everybody loved each other. We worked hard together, um, and, and we, didn't, uh, we didn't pit each other against each other. You know, we, we wanted to do the job for him. That was our main goal. Because you lo liked him so we, much? We liked him. I mean, he could, oh, he could be so irritating sometimes. <laughs> He could be so irritating, but the thing about Jack, he never, ever held a grudge. <clears throat> he could yell and scream at you one minute, and the next minute, honey, can you go get me a cup of coffee? Or, well, he didn't call me honey, but you know, he would say- Or he'd make it up did. to you. He would make it up to you some way. He, he might not say, I'm sorry, but he would show that he wasn't upset mm -hmm. at you or anything. He, but um, he never held a grudge, not against his staff and not against anybody else mm -hmm. either. And I'm sure that was, Again, part of the football thing, you know, they, they were opponents on the field, but they were uh, friends. So, so what was irritating about him? Oh, he never liked to make a decision about anything. I was the one that had the, the job of um, getting him to make decisions on all of the speaking engagements. And as years went on, you know, the speaking engagement request just went on and on and on. And he wanted to be the one to make the decision, but he didn't want to take the time to make the decision. So I would spend hours and hours organizing this uh, pile of invitations to get him to sit down. And I would be there until 9, 10 o'clock at night trying to get him to make decisions. And then he'd, he'd lose um, interest in it. So I eventually got to the point where I'd, uh, I'd get so upset that he wouldn't spend any time with me that I'd say, okay, if you don't give me an answer right now, this is how I'm going to handle it. And then suddenly I'd get an answer out of him about something. And that's the way we had to work it sometimes. He, it, he wasn't trying to be nasty or anything. He, he just had so many things going on in his mind. He didn't want to 
have to deal with those little, what was little to him, but these were people who were waiting for months for answers on whether they, he was gonna come to their district for um, a, a breakfast or a lunch or whatever. Or, and as again, years went on, it wasn't just his district, it was nationally. So, so what's it like being the chief of staff for somebody like this? Well, actually not all of that difficult. I will go back to my football analogy, though, about Jack's supposed inability to make decisions because I think what a quarterback does is he m releases that ball to whomever the receiver is <clears throat> based on a hundredth of a second decision as to who's open. And so you don't make decisions in advance. You do make decisions at the last moment. Memory is necessary, as Sharon has pointed out because Jack would make a commitment to a colleague on the floor that he was going to Spartanburg, South Carolina to speak at a breakfast for this member and then not tell Sharon and Sharon gets a phone call and of course you can imagine what it is from there. I think much of what a chief of staff has to do is to stay in as much communication with everyone in those three offices including the member and the role of the personal assistant is critical because if the door's been shut and the door's been shut for an hour, you need to know whether Jude is in there with him or Art's in there with him or whatever the circumstances might be. You need to look at his travel schedule to see where there were opportunities for additional meetings or for input from these people. Um, intelligence gathering at its uh, uh, required best had to be part of the job so that you knew where he was on any particular issue in terms of the inputs to him, in terms of where he wanted those inputs to go into the legislative process or those inputs go into constituent services in terms of an issue back in Buffalo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So did you know what everybody on the staff was doing? I, nobody ever knows that, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that you, you're, you're going to succeed if you're in the 90% range and you're gonna to totally fail if you're much less than that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I think that's true. I mean, President of the United States doesn't know what his own cabinet members are doing. Uh, and in many cases, that's a very good thing for them. Uh, but I think, you know, Jack did stay on top of whatever he felt were his priorities. Decisions are pyramids. And so, you know, when it came to that top 10% of the pyramid, which constituted 90% of the decisions, Jack was, that's where he was. He wasn't anywhere else on that pyramid. But back to John's point earlier, um, he, he put people in jobs that he knew were going to take care of it. Yeah, his, look at he surrounded himself with detail people. Right. <laughs> he, his it, philosophy was uh, about details. If you're going to, he would look to see if you handled some little tiny thing because he figured if you're taking care of that little tiny thing, then you've got the big things taken care of too. Yeah. He, would, and, and the, uh, he was on two subcommittees in appropriations, defense, and and uh, foreign operations, and he uh, would depend on, on me to tee up uh, issues. Either there was some particular witness that was particularly important for him to hear, or uh, if during the markup season that there were particular things of interest to him that he uh, had to be sure he was uh, going to be there and uh, working with um, uh, Sharon and Randy, we, we often got uh, matters of high public policy interest to converge with his schedule in such a way that um, uh, he could act on them. Uh, but uh, as Sharon suggested, he, he liked to uh, delegate uh, responsibility for tasks to people he, in whom he had confidence and then depend on them to, to tee things up for him in such a way that he could act on them. Mm -hmm. um, so he, start, he starts out when he's, when he's first in Congress, he's on education and labor and was on the uh, select subcommittee on, uh, for, on education. How long did he stay there and what did he do while he was in that? Actually, I don't remember the length of time that he was there before the committee changes occurred. But I think education and labor, he made work for him in a very important way. I mean, he had colleges and universities within his district. He obviously had his own views of education and the role of government in education. And which so were, that was staffed out were, and so forth. Which were, I mean, was he, uh, did he, was he in favor of federal aid education and so on? I think Jack felt that the best education was local. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think he strongly advocated that position and felt that the federal government's slow movement into education was going to have the inevitable end of being total control of education in the country, which of course pretty much manifested itself during the George W. Bush administration. Uh, but he, he gave a lot of time and effort to that. The labor issues were important to him, not just the education issues. 
uh, and of course not an easy position to have for a Republican because that committee under the Democrats since for, with the exception of a few years since the end of the Second World War had been dominated by organized labor. Now organized labor was very important to Jack and so he had to figure out within his constituency how he was going to meld these. But there's no doubt that Jack felt that you know, where he wanted to go, and Bill Snyder has mentioned this in terms of not going on ways and means, because if you go on ways and means, you're captured by the process of ways and means. He could do what he wished to do in terms of tax policy, tax legislation, and so forth, but being out of the committee more easily so he, than he, he could never by sought being to in be the on ways and means. If he did, I did not see. Okay, it. but he did see, he did, he must have sought to get on to budget and appropriations. Right. Yes. So yes. how did that happen? I think Bill would be better to answer. Yeah, well, uh, uh, appropriations was particularly difficult for someone who had served less than five terms. Uh, with the appropriations, uh, you, that was uh, your only committee. You, you, uh, because of the distribution of work on the subcommittees, you were, member was uh, just too busy. So it was a, a, a testimony to, to how well he was respected by his uh, colleagues in the, in the Congress, especially the leadership, to, to put him on uh, the Appropriations Committee, which when is... When uh, did he go on Appropriations? Uh, in January 77. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but he knew he was going to uh, go on it in December, which is when uh, uh, I... Uh, December 76, which is uh, when we had a discussion about uh, uh, about serving there. So he, he clearly had uh, gone there and he did seek service on the subcommittees that were unambiguously uh, functions of the federal government, the uh, defense and, and foreign operations, which uh, didn't produce any uh, conflict, let's say, or dissonance with, with his uh, views on uh, domestic policy. Of course, he had responsibility for the whole of government with the Appropriations Committee, but his, his uh, detailed service was on those two subcommittees. Well, he was on budget too, wasn't he? At one point, uh, not, it may have been later, or not when I served. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, John, did you get specific assignments from him? Is that the, is the way things worked in the office? You, or did you? How, how did you? How did you know what to do? Uh, him? How did he lead? Well, uh, because he was always speaking, and uh, I was writing speeches, and so there was constant back and forth as to. Um, how he would articulate his, uh, his views. Um, that's really also later on, we'll probably get to this this afternoon at the um, 80s session when he ran for president. That's also how his views on policy were ham hammered out when he had several speechwriters at that point and what he actually thought about a certain issue was hammered out by the speechwriters trying to wrestle back and forth. Okay, so he's got a, it, it was, some of his ideas, I take it, were speech-driven, so he would get the speechwriter in and other people and discuss the thing. And right, talk. or he would ask for, essentially for a memo um, on my thoughts on something. Um, if Jude had sent something, he would. I would usually get uh, the letter with a, something, John, what do you think? You know, or, so that meant that I had to give him my ideas. And there's... Um, Often you'd find yourself uh, having to have a take on the history of economics or something like that. And I, uh, I had like a, a six foot shelf of books <laughs> always from the Library of Congress because uh, there was uh, just a wide range of what he was interested in. But it was, it was mostly through speech writing and through memos that he was asking for. Congressional Research Service was uh, always on speed dial. I would like to mention that during this time period, we didn't have, we didn't even have correcting selectric typewriters. We had manual typewriters, we had regular electric typewriters, but no selectric, uh, correcting selectrics. We had no computers, we had no email, we had no cell phones. We did everything. We had mimeograph machines. Um, it, it was hard. It was a lot harder back in those days to do what we did because nowadays, of course, they have all this technology, and we still managed to get it all done. I mean, we hand-typed letters back to our constituents um, who, for casework and things like that. Everything, everything was done by hand. Um, let me get something straight, uh, Randy. Go through the, the, the chiefs of staff in order. Before, before you, who was, who was for his first chief of staff? Uh, James Cromwell. 
Cromwell. Uh, and he came mm -hmm. from the 1970 campaign structure. Um, and mm -hmm. then there was a transition period that I'm not sure of what the length was, but uh, Cromwell was in fact uh, leaving the position. Uh, uh, Harry Clark uh, was sort of de facto during this brief transition period. Uh, how long, how long was Harry Clark there? Uh, I do not know. Mm -hmm. uh, he was there when I arrived in September of, uh, of 73 uh, through John Ehrlichman's recommendation from the White House, uh, through a network of Christian scientists involved in the Nixon administration. Um, and uh, Harry Clark was a John Ehrlichman recommendee? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. and, uh, and so he was there for a while. I came in, as I say, in September of 73 with his double title of administrative assistant and legislative director. Uh, and then I left in February of 79. And uh, David- That's when Dave Smith- that's, Well, that's John right. was in there for a little while. John long. was there. Uh, we had some overlap. Uh, not sure how long it was, but there was an overlap period. And, uh, and David Smith became uh, the next chief of staff, and then David Hoppe after that. Yeah, and David then Hoppe. David Hoppe uh, after that. Were there different styles to the various chiefs of staff? Well, I can. Yeah, you're probably the. Or it was just one of you. Randy and and then um, Dave Smick and then Dave Hoppy. So what were there? Were there? Well, then none of them bothered me. <laughs> <laughs> but she was the critical source of information mm -hmm. for anyone who was chief of staff, because she knew in greater detail where Jack was, what it, he was doing, what decisions needed to be made, whether they were scheduling or whatever, and so. I, I'll be very blunt about this. The chief of staff had to stay so much in contact with Sharon during her period and others during their uh, times there because that really was the source of information, even down to I need to get in touch with him, where is he? Uh, but more in the sense of structuring meetings so that we could go in and go through a speech or go in and go through some other decision. There were minor decisions by the tens of thousands, of course, but, you know, major decisions as well. Should he speak at the National Convention in 1976 in Kansas City? If he does speak, what is the opportunity created by that? Uh, what should he say? I would say one thing about an efficiency aspect of Jack that's very important, and I don't know whether this was more motivated by getting the word out are motivated by him trying to help the staff in doing that. But if we did a significant speech, let's say, uh, what Jack would do would be to make it clear to us, try to use this in every format that you can. Put it, in, have a colleague, put it in the congressional record so his colleagues see what he's saying. Have the press guy see if he can do this as an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. See if the press guy can get it into uh, specialty magazines that might have an interest in it. Uh, take the work product and see if you can do five, six, seven, whatever the number might be, variations, lengths of it, and so forth to get the message out in as many ways as possible so that you weren't having to do seven or eight speeches. You could do one speech and do variations on theme to get the word out on that and to get his name out. I mean, it did have the political interest as well. Right. So um, what would you say were the toughest decisions that Jack Kemp had to make while he was? Whether to run for higher office, mm -hmm. without any question. Mm -hmm. uh, whether to run for governor of New York when a vacancy was being created, whether to run for senator from New York when a vacancy was being created. Okay, and um, so how did, how, how did that unfold? Well, it would unfold with a massive amount of consternation. I mean, what are the pros, what are the cons? You know, and there would be an enormous amount of time and effort given to that. Um, and Jack believed that the core of his being uh, in the Reagan 11th commandment, that thou shalt not speak ill of any other Republican, and that had a heavy influence on this. Uh, when he was asked by uh, uh, constituents, by uh, financial, uh, do by donors, and so forth to run against Javits in the Republican primary when Javits was seeking an additional term, Jack was first of all motivated by not speaking ill of another Republican. And obviously if you're gonna run against him in the primary, you've got to do that. This is 1980. And, and then the decision was, you know, whether to run, should I run? I think Jack 
It's important, and I don't mean to denigrate anything in saying this, but and Jack and I had a fascinating conversation, just the two of us one night in his office, and it was really a lengthy conversation, uh, that professional sports and politics have shared dimensions. A politician is always testing uh, whether what he says is resonating by the applause of the crowd, by the feedback. Uh, a professional athlete gets immediate response by the roar of the crowd on Sunday afternoon or the booze of the crowd on a Sunday afternoon. And not to denigrate professional sports or politics and public service, but they were both somehow under an umbrella of, of, uh, of entertainment. Uh, from a from a the standpoint of the person watching the process, and so Jack was reluctant to run against another Republican, and obviously he did not run against Javits, and uh, Al D'Amato did run against Javits and won the seat and remained in the Senate for two or three terms. I don't remember how long, but I don't think Jack ever walked around having regrets that he did not do that. I mean, you stay where you are and you continue to do what you do. Um, did, he, did he do polling and stuff like that? Well, make of course, you're decisions? always doing pollings, but I don't think Jack paid that much attention to polls. I mean, mm -hmm. Jack was not a person who was, you know, concerned about polls. Jack was more concerned about what he was hearing. You know, if I run against Javits, to use that example, you know, where are people on the state executive committee of the Republican Party? Where are my Republican colleagues in the House going to be on this? Where are the donors going to be? Uh, Jack from upstate New York would have a disadvantage against running from anybody from downstate New York. And so he would assess all of those things. But, you know, if the New York Times had done a poll, Jack would have read the poll, but he wouldn't have paid much attention to it because polls reflect what happened yesterday or last night, not what's going to happen tomorrow or tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. um, wh how in touch was he with the political establishment in New York? I mean, you get the impression, for example, in his presidential campaign, you had a lot of those New York Republicans go, going for Bush. So what was, did he, did he neglect some of the powers in the New York I, delegation? I, I, I would not characterize it as neglect, but it is for sure that Jack was never an insider on that process. Uh, you remember at the Miller Center, I brought for one of the props a cartoon from one of the New York uh, paid newspapers a political cartoon of Nelson Rockefeller sitting at his desk with a shocked expression on his face as this balloon went up behind him saying Kemp for VP. But Jack was an outsider to that process and yet I did not know this until maybe three years ago that Nelson had, Rockefeller had really made it clear that he wanted Jack elected in 1970 and a friend of many of us in this room who died last Thursday, Jim Cannon, was sent by uh, uh, Nelson up to uh, Jack's campaign in Buffalo to make sure that Jack had enough money in that campaign to do the advertising and so forth to get him over the top. And that was a story that I did not know until mm -hmm. about three years ago mm -hmm. when Jim and I had lunch one day. Uh, How much money did he get from Rockville? It was, you know, it's very interesting because uh, Cannon was sent up there to make sure Jack had the money and he went up there, he attended a meeting with 14, I think was the number of persons that Jack had assembled from the community to make sure that they could borrow the money needed in the last days of the campaign and they did not need any money from the Rockefeller operation. But it was there as a guarantor of sorts had it been needed. Uh, and so at least at that period, you know, here's the governor of New York State you know, not of Jack's political persuasion necessarily, you know, saying I want this guy elected, I want this additional Republican in Congress. But when it came to uh, the state chairman of the Republican Party and things like that, there were communications there, you know, that went on. But Jack was never an insider to that process. And I think that when he considered running for governor or running for the United States Senate, that it would be running as an outsider and the natural disadvantages of that were one, you were an outsider, two, you didn't have that networking inside the party that you would have had if you had been an insider, three, that you were from upstate New York, and four, that you know certainly you were more conservative in your worldview uh, than the majority of the people inside of that club in New York State. Good. 
Larry, I'm sorry Larry Casey isn't here, um, because back to, again, Jack hiring people to do certain things, Larry Casey was hired to kind of keep, I mean, he did obviously legislative things too, but he was there also because of uh, the New York connection, and he kind of kept his fingers on the pulse of what was going on up there to give Jack advice. So did Jack ever agonize over decisions like opposing an administration on policy, like, for example, Ford on either defense policy or economic policy? I think he uh, differed between uh, people and policy. He was, um, he was, he was very policy oriented, and I don't think he had any qualms about opposing even Reagan on a policy if he thought it was wrong. Uh, where he did have qualms uh, was on opposing Reagan for president uh, when uh, Jude Uniski and Art Laffer had a uh, scheme to get Jack to run for uh, president in 1980. And uh, we spoke about that at the, um, um, at the Miller Center when we spoke uh, on April 18th about the, um, the tax, um, tax plans. Um, they thought they had uh, Jack to agree to, to to meet with Reagan, tell him that he was going to, he was going to run against Reagan, but uh, uh, would throw his support uh, afterwards uh, if he if he didn't succeed. But uh, at the dinner when this was supposed to happen, Jack just said, "You know, Mr. Mr. Reagan, I, I would never run against you." And um, he was, uh, I think, I used the phrase at that uh, when we spoke about it at that time. Jack was a cautious risk taker. Um, he had nothing to prove. He had, prove, he had a previous career. He was a success as a, as a football player, and so he really had nothing to, to prove uh, personally. I think he was really caught up mostly in the ideas that he was promoting uh, than in uh, a personal ambition. Uh, he's, he was ambitious in a certain sense, but uh, not really ambitious for himself, if that, if that makes sense. Um, uh, why, why was he neutral in the 1976 presidential race between Reagan and, uh, and Ford when, you know, so much of his previous career he'd been an admirer of Reagan? Well, I think the bottom line is that Jack had a large segment of the Kemp uh, crowd on one side and a large segment of the Kemp crowd on the other side of this. I mean, you have to remember that Jack and Chowder and Marching would be a good example, had been, you know, one of the members in that club, which included Ford and Mel Laird and people like that, uh, for which he had strong attachments and relationships. And then, you know, he had others who were there with Reagan. And I think it was uh, a, a lose either way uh, in the sense that if you chose A, B was not going to be at all satisfied and would actually perhaps weaken you with those people and the vice versa of that. And so some people saw it as indecision. Uh, I think Jack felt like either one of these people, you know, are going to do what they do and I will work with them if they get elected, et cetera. Um, and I, I think that was the motivation. John may have or Sharon may have other views on that, but I felt Jack believed there was no necessity uh, there were there were more negatives to making that decision than there were the benefits of him trying to reach both of those camps with the message of uh, these economic policies and tax changes that were necessary. So uh, how did he He'd make be burning bridges? How did he go about making that decision, and how much did they lean on him to join them, their campaign? Uh, I I think. Uh, there was a lot of leaning on him, but probably less than he thought that there was going to be. Um, and uh, uh, gosh, uh, you know, once the outcome of the convention was what it was, you know, then he was the loyal player from there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think interestingly enough, in 76, Jack achieved what had been a political objective of not burning bridges. Um, and then of course, after Ford lost that race and Carter became president. Carter was obviously such a target for Jack in terms of economic policies and so forth that what might have been a high level of tension had Ford won that race. Uh, and, but it all worked out. I mean, this is the amazing thing about Jack Kemp in his career is how things really work out. Because from all of that uh, 76 period, you had a Democrat winning 
And so Ford was no longer there to be the president that you would have to interact with, and Reagan became, you know, eventually the odd zone as to who was going to be the next nominee. And so Jack was able to essentially ignore the one and create a lot of focus on the other. Mm -hmm. He was at the right time at the right place to be able to do that, not because he controlled the situation, because he was, but rather he was able to operate in the situation which emerged. So just uh, was, it, was it an agonizing process to, to decide to stay neutral, or was it an easy decision for him? I don't think it was an easy decision, but I don't think it was an agonizing decision either. Uh -huh. So the only agonizing decisions that you can remember were over whether to, whether to jump and go to, go to the... Challenge Javits. That was the hardest decision. Yeah, I think so. So did did he operate largely by instinct and gut and philosophy and stuff in making decisions? Did he sort of know where he would come down without doing a lot of soul searching? You want to respond to that? <laughs> I don't. Uh, he would listen to a lot of people, but I'll tell you, Jude Winitsky had a lot of influence on him back in those days. So we know that Jude, Jude is, the, is the one who persuades him to do lowering rates. Yes. And Jude tried to get him to be uh, Reagan's vice presidential candidate by running against him. What, what, were, what were Jude, some of Jude's other projects with him? And how did they interact? Jude Winiski is a person whose name keeps coming up all the time. So tell us about Jude Winiski and his relationship with Jack Kent. Well, that would take a whole session in itself. <laughs> uh, um, he certainly did have a lot, have a lot of influence on, uh, on Jack. Uh, he had a great deal to do with the formulation of uh, supply-side ideas, which came um, not only from Art Laffer, but also from uh, Robert Mundell, um, two excellent economists. Mundell, of course, went on to uh, get the Nobel uh, Prize in economics. Um, Jude... Um, they also blew hot and cold over time. I think uh, they were much closer uh, in the early years that we're talking about than later on, I think, uh, when uh, it was mo mostly from Jude's side. He, he would excommunicate um, almost everyone at one point or another for an infraction against supply side. Um, I, it was not just big things, uh, but the small things. I remember... Uh, um, he gave some impassioned speeches on the floor of the House um, when uh, the Prime Minister of, of Italy, Aldo Moro, was kidnapped. And he, uh, Jude Winiski thought that this was the, the margin uh, of civilization uh, to get uh, Aldo Moro freed. And so uh, Jack would give speeches on freeing Aldo Moro, uh, who unfortunately, I think uh, he was uh, finally found dead. But uh, um, Jude did have a, a great deal of influence on him and, and could get Jack to uh, uh, share that enthusiasm. And so what happened to the relationship later? Um, I think that um, neither of them was over discreet, I would say, but I think that um, Jude was much more indiscreet, and that's what uh, made him a liability, I think, to the, the Reagan administration. And... Um, what, 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 what? what he would he would give interviews to um, the Village Voice or something, um, which often became embarrassing um, either to Jack or to the Reagan administration when uh, uh, Jack was trying to get the, the Reagan Reagan to run on uh, uh, Jack's ideas. Um, so that was a part of it. Uh, Jude was always trying to push the envelope even further than Jack wanted to, and I think that created a lot of tensions. Um, he had um, his own idiosyncrasies, I think. Um, was there a point where Jude was sort of read out of the, the I don't think that, that Jack ever read anyone uh, out. It was mostly that uh, Jude sort of excommunicated himself uh, by excommunicating the rest of the world. Yeah, but there was a point where Jack wouldn't take his phone calls. Oh, really? This was in, when we were at Empower America. Um, I so that was there, after the... It was after, right. yeah. But it, there was a point where he, he just really didn't communicate with them very much at all. And then when, toward the end, right before uh, Jude passed away, they weren't speaking at all. Mm -hmm. But I do think you have to give Jude Winiski a great deal of credit oh, absolutely. for what he brought to Jack because he not only brought to Jack the ideas that were necessary to make the, what originally had been 
John, you would probably remember the title of this far better than would I, but the investment uh, incentives and all of this long worded to eventually five or six uh, reiterations later, the Jobs Creation Act, the focus on rates, the focus on the individual taxpayers so as to reach more voters, to be quite frank, but also to accomplish the intended economic objectives. But he also brought to Jack the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. And you know what Jack had been doing prior to then would occasionally get some kind of a national press pickup. But once Jack was in harmony, shall we say, through Jude primarily, but not exclusively, with what the Wall Street Journal could do for publicizing what Jack was doing in terms of his economic policies, the legislation, and so forth, it moved Jack to a different stage in terms of his visibility not only with the readers of the journal, but including within the readers of the journal, the Republicans around the country who were uh, important to making decisions about leadership. Uh, it had a substantial pickup with his colleagues in the House, his Republican colleagues, because you know these people are reading the journal, or their LDs, or their LAs, or their chiefs of staff are reading the journal. And so it really did elevate Jack. And you know the period, I came on board, as I've indicated several times here, in late 73. You know, Jude really starts becoming visible within Jack's life in 75, the transition into 76. And Jude's first really great moment in all of this, I think, was the opportunity through Jack speaking to the Republican National Convention in Kansas City, you know, a summary of these views this in a way that was designed. Speech? Right, that was designed to tell, energize well, tell us about, the Republican Party. Tell us about the, Party. apparently this is a major moment, the speech. So to, were you involved in it? I was not, I was okay. not. Okay. So, how, so how, well, it was well, a major opportunity. Uh, it, was, it did not turn out to be a major moment uh, because great effort was taken. And we were making revisions in Tell this. Tell us about the efforts. Well, the efforts were to put together the defining speech for Jack Kemp within the Republican Party at that period. I mean, you know, you have the whole nation watching. You have part of the world watching. You certainly have Republican partisans watching and so forth. And we kept working on his, this. His job at the convention was to introduce somebody, right? Well, that was part of the job. Uh, but, you know, internally the job was seen as the opportunity yeah, right. to, to speak and deliver a, a great speech that might catapult him uh, into greater prominence within the party. And so great effort was undertaken. Uh, we were still working on the speech in, his, in Jack's suite at the convention. Uh, and who Jack... Drafted, who drafted the speech? Uh, Jude, more than anybody else. I mean, it was a, it was a product of a committee. But, you know, Jack, obviously, at the top of that pyramid, Jude having tremendous influence on the text of the speech, I was involved, less so than Jude, for sure, I will acknowledge that. Uh, but uh, what happened was, is that, you know, a national convention in those days, very different coverage from what you have now. Um, in those days, in-depth coverage, and in-depth coverage means that you're not only covering what's happening on the floor of the convention, but you're interviewing people and so forth. And on the whole, Jack's speech never appeared to the American people because they were cutaways, to use that phrase. Mm -hmm. They would simply go and interview somebody else, some analysis and so forth. And Jack's speech was not seen by, heard by, nearly the audience in the country that we thought it would have been heard by. It was by the people, the producers that make the decisions, uh, the directors and so forth on uh, are we going to cover this speech or not was pretty much uniformly we're not covering this speech and so therefore it didn't get four network coverage, this was pre-cable days and so forth, the way that we had hoped that it was. It still had impact because... What was the impact? Well, I think the impact was one, this speaks very well of Jack that he was given the opportunity because you don't give somebody an opportunity like this unless inside of the power structure within the party there's a sense that Jack Kemp is a real comer um, and that he inspires people because let's face it Jack was highly inspirational as a speaker when he delivered his message on this and so I think that worked well for him obviously we took the text of that speech and in the context of the comments I made a few moments ago we were able to you know, utilize that as a, as a new marker 
uh, as to how to deliver the message, et cetera. So I mm -hmm. think it worked this well. This was for not him, a Kemp Roth speech yet, though, no, right? No. But it was not it, nearly the coverage that we thought it was going yeah. to be. What, and we were just, disappointed by that. Well, but he, it was a nomination speech, right? It wasn't, who was he nominating? Do you remember? I do not. I have to be honest. I do not. Okay. Um, okay. So um, would you say that, uh, that, that he had a organized mind, a messy mind, a frenetic mind? How, how, what? Among those three choices you just <laughs> given me, I would say it was frenetically organized. Yeah, uh -huh. so. Uh, I mean, Jack just, he, he, was, he was a sponge in a positive sense of that word. His brain was of absorbing these inputs. But, you know, Jack was a man in a hurry, to use that hackneyed expression, um, and without any particular knowledge as to where this hurriedness was going to go. Uh, but, you know, that's the reason he would work these 14, 16, 17 hour days. And, and, and endlessly, I mean, you know, other than a tennis match or something like that, you know, just he'd be here four days a week and then he would be on the road the next three days. He, what time did he come in in the morning? He um, would come in about 9.30. He usually had breakfast with the, with the kids. Yeah, very important to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the family was very important. And then I'd, I'd get a call about 7 o'clock from Jeff saying, I can't, he, he had a rule that he, Nobody was allowed to go out until every, the family sat down for dinner. Mm -hmm. So I get this frantic call. Jeff wanted to go out on a date or something like that. Can you get him home a little early tonight? You know, that kind of thing. So he was always home for dinner? So, now they'd eat late sometimes, but yeah. Oh, I see. So in other words, the family had to wait till the end of the day, to end of his day to eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was amazing to me how many of his uh, children's sports functions and oh, so yeah. forth he was able oh. to get to you know he would disappear and you know yeah. whether it was a football or a this or that or the other and then you know an hour and a half later he would or whatever he would be back in the office and pick up where he left off but he had such a sense of that and I had four children and so eventually I came to understand the importance of that uh, but four children is much greater than two children, I will tell you. It's not just two more, it's yeah. exponential rather than, ar than arithmetic. And yet he just consistently was there for his kids. Yeah, we always had to work the schedule around football games. Uh, it got very difficult sometimes to, to fit everything in. So okay. normally committee hearings are, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning or something like that. Did, was he the kind of committee member who actually sat through hearings? He did a lot of delegation on that, you know. and if it was a markup or something like that, yeah, he would he, he, he would go. But pretty much, he he'd let the staff member handle it, and then they'd call him if he really needed to get there. Uh -huh. So, uh, but on I mean, here he, when he well, he becomes ranking later on on um, the Defense Appropriations Committee uh, or Foreign Ops. I'm sorry, um, but according to Bill Schneider, he sort of did read line by line. Um, did he take his committee's jobs seriously in detail? Um, in other words, know the content of all the legislation and stuff like that, or was it, did he get briefed? I think as Sharon said, he would delegate it to the staff member who was assigned to that committee. And uh, it, the briefing would be as long as Jack would allow, really. He, he was an impatient guy and so didn't uh, spend a lot of time in, um, it was usually on the fly when you were headed down to a vote or down to the committee room. Yeah, you had to walk with them a lot. Right. But, <laughs> as, but, as a, but as the appropriations bill was taking shape, he knew the critical issues within it, that bill for what he was going to spend his time on. He was a quick study. He yeah. was a very quick study. I mean, because he, he didn't want to embarrass himself or anyone else by not being on top of something. And so if there was something that really needed to come out of this bill, and of course in the minority you have limited input, uh, but at the same time he would be on top of those things. Now there's a, a quote from Ed Rollins uh, referring to the 88 campaign, but I just wonder whether it applies to what your experience was. And it was that he was impossible to discipline um, and he simply wouldn't listen, 
he had a quarterback mentality, and the quarterback thinks that, uh, that, that he knows how to call the big plays, and he didn't listen to anybody else. I, I, I don't think that's fair. I understand where Ed Rollins is trying to go. Uh, because what Ed Rollins should be saying there is Ed gave him advice and Jack did not necessarily follow it. But Jack, and I said this a few moments ago, was a sponge when it came to absorbing. Jack was always listening. He was a very good listener. But the listening that he did in respect to me or anyone else was absorbed in terms of that issue, in terms of what he had heard from everybody else. Uh, Jack often being accused of undisciplined, uh, that may be also a difference as to where Jack thought he should spend his time and where a manager wanted to spend his time. But it is true in that campaign that, you know, we had issues with keeping him on track. When he ran for Vice President of the United States in the 96 campaign, not all of those issues had been resolved. And there has been fairly significant criticism among people who have written in the 96 campaign as to Jack being disengaged from some part of that campaign. The great uh, presidential, vice presidential debate uh, against Al Gore in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, where Jack's performance was not a good performance, but it was not a good performance because Jack was not disciplined. It was not a good performance because the Dole people had tied both hands behind Jack's back. In what way? As, as to Wouldn't what? let any of his um, people around him. They, mm -hmm. they just cut him off. I mean, John wasn't allowed there, uh, Dave wasn't allowed there, no one, uh, even Jude, I mean, nobody let his brain trust in there with him. And, and, and I would phrase him. that a somewhat different way. Jack was expected to be the vice presidential uh, representative, uh, to say it in a different term, mouthpiece for the Dole campaign, because after all, Dole was the one running for president. But the unfortunate consequence was that they tried to make Jack something he was not. And so it took the uh, Jack Kemp enthusiasm behind a podium out of it. It made him look very stiff. Uh, he was limited substantially as to what he could say in respect to tax policies. He was not allowed to do the Kemp presentation on tax policy. Um, and of course, trying to figure out how to be where Bob Dole was on any particular issue, and I say this in kindness to Bob Dole, but a man that has served decades in the Senate, run for president a number of times, et cetera, very difficult to figure out where he was on any particular issue. Um, St. Petersburg was an amazing experience for me. I grew up in St. Petersburg. I made the decision not to stay with the staff at the Benoit Hotel. I stayed at my mother's house. What happened in St. Petersburg? Uh, that that was the debate. That was oh, the place oh, of the I debate. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so we all got together at the hotel after, and Jack came in. We had a debrief about this. It was not particularly long because the flight the next morning was unbelievably early. Uh, and by this time, it was 1, 1 30 in the morning. And so I felt this is great. I can go back to my mother's house, sneak through the front door, get a good night's sleep, et cetera. I opened the door, the house was completely dark. I started to go very quietly across the living room floor. And my mother says, out of the darkness, he didn't do too well, did he? <laughs> and I felt, well, that may summarize what the nation's papers are gonna be saying in a couple of hours, and, uh, and it did. Oh, he did. But like Jack he did. was not able to be Jack Kemp, and I think that had the greatest effect upon confining him as to what he was supposed to do in that hour or hour and a half. I forget how long the debate was. We often used to say, let Kemp be Kemp. That was mm -hmm. I wasn't with him in 96, but I think in that particular debate, his role was to attack Gore, basically, and Jack was not good on the attack. Yeah. He, he, was, he was just too nice. He would not uh, go after uh, anyone in a, in a be the attack dog that a vice presidential candidate has to be. So who were, who were his minders during the campaign? Uh, was this was just, just for the debate that he was isolated from his own people or throughout the campaign? Uh, well, my comments were focused on the debate itself uh, because that was a defining moment because let's face it, mm -hmm. a vice presidential candidate in a presidential campaign has enormous difficulty getting any visibility. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, vice presidential debate that year was limited to one debate. Mm -hmm. And so this was the opportunity and it was an opportunity uh, that certainly didn't achieve the objectives that we would have wanted for him. Were you there for the debate prep? Uh, Part of it, but I will have to tell you, Jack spent most of the day 
not in preparation for that debate. I mean, you have to assume, let's face it, this man had been a member of Congress, he had been a member of the cabinet of a president of the United States, he had been involved in public policy issues through uh, Empower America and so forth, and so what kind of prep do you need? You know everything Al Gore has said in his entire life, you know what you believe on these issues, and you're confined on what you believe in these issues to trying to harmonize it with what the presidential candidate believes in these issues. And so, uh, and I think also there was some concern that if you spent the whole day in prep, the uh, actual debate would be anticlimactic, which is not something that you would want to happen. And I think Jack spent a great deal of his day playing tennis that yeah, I day. I think he did too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought on earlier, yeah, earlier occasions, I think Jack did rise to the occasion in the, his 1980 convention speech, mm -hmm. for example. He really did focus on, on that. He had to focus on uh, practicing with the teleprompter and uh, making and just making sure he had the lines down. And uh, that was a speech that was very effectively done, and he really did apply himself mm -hmm. in, in that case. I think his. Uh, big occasions like a convention speech, I think you tend to... Uh, and 84 also. 84. In Dallas. Um, what was the decision... Uh, now, do, going into the, the 1980 campaign, when Reagan uh, is... He, he, de he must have decided fairly early that he was going to support Reagan? I cannot be... It was, I, it was Reagan, I appreciate Bush you and, asking me that question, but by the time we got to the 1980 campaign, I was practicing law in Boston, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and was not involved in the 80 mm -hmm. campaign. I was not. So you're going to have to get an Art answer Laffer from somebody and Winiski, else. Art as, as uh, John refers to, uh, tried to engineer a, a scheme whereby Jack would be... would run against Reagan and then be chosen God. Veep. I don't, I don't Do remember you, all that. I was... Uh, yeah, we spoke about that a little bit at the... Yeah. Uh, yeah. But did, was he disappointed that he didn't was enter into the Veep, the, the Veep race? I mean, that, that Bush, uh, that Reagan chose Bush? If he was, I don't think he ever expressed it. Um, he was kind of fatalistic, I think, about his own personal ambitions. Uh, and he was, you know, he, he, I think he has, it, it often commented about having been... Uh, cut, uh, booed uh, by uh, 100,000 people, it, it just, he took it all philosophically. If he wasn't picked, he just didn't win that game and he would go on to the next one. Um, you know, some of what has been published about the decision process within the Reagan camp during that period was that uh, Lynn Nofsinger did not, who was the chief political advisor to Reagan in the campaign, uh, did not support Jack as the candidate for that post presumably because perhaps he felt that uh, the party needed to be re reunited and you needed to take somebody from the other wing of the party, of which George Bush was not the only choice, but certainly an obvious choice. Uh, but some of what has been published, at least, about the decision-making process indicated that Knopfsinger was negative on it, and without Knopfsinger signing off on it, Reagan was reluctant to uh, choose anyone else. I think party unification was the, the deciding factor in that. Um, Reagan wanted to win, and uh, so he wanted to bring together the two wings of the party. Which you needed because he was running against an incumbent president, which is very different from running for an open seat. He needed well, that party. Let me, let, uh, let's uh, finish up by talking about Buffalo and his relationship to the district. Um, Presumably, in the first few terms, he was up there a lot, and then as time went on, it he wasn't there as much. Right. Yeah, toward the late 70s, um, it w he probably maybe went once a, uh, a month up there. But in he, the beginning? Well... It would have been more frequent. There was no yeah. question about that. But Every you know, weekend. They Jack had, had a, 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 a very good office up there. Uh, headed by a person that had their own visibility within the community uh, because of their own professional sports background, Ed so yeah. Ed Rakowski. And so, and there, and Ed could easily step in for Jack and give a speech or an appearance or receive an award or give an award and so forth. And Jack was very much uh, buttressed, I think, within his district by doing that. Um, and I think it's true with many members of Congress uh, that, you know, once you go through several re-election campaigns, you change the nature of how it is that you're interacting with the district. 
Uh, Jack had the advantage of having a district that was roughly an hour away by plane, substantially different from representing some other part of the country, and he used that to his advantage. And he also, and I think this is very interesting, because I think this is unusual for a member of Congress. I was his chief of staff for right at six years, and I went to Buffalo, I think, only twice during that entire period. And both of those times that I went there were for election nights. So you want to be there for the celebration and so forth. Jack did not rely upon his Washington staff to do the kind of interaction with the district that required them to be there. We did all kinds of interaction with the district, legislatively, um, constituent services and so forth, but he didn't expect you to get on the plane and be in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. He did have major projects that he was trying yes, to Yes, yes, and, and Eddie did take very good care of that. I think as, again, talking about the late 70s, the more Jack became well known uh, nationally, I think his constituents cut him a little slack because they became so proud of what he was doing and the fact that he became so popular that they, they weren't as um, strict about having, they weren't upset when he couldn't make it up there. He, he did not, he was pretty uh, focused on uh, constituent service in terms of answering mail oh, and, yeah. and uh, do we had bird dogging uh, you know, requests that they had. Uh, How many caseworkers did you have in the office? We then? have uh, two in Washington and one in Buffalo. Uh -huh. And were they primarily answering mail or were they, or, or were they uh, well, doing projects? Well, if somebody project? didn't get their Social Security benefits, they were on the phone trying to find out where that was. I mean, they whatever this constituent needed, they were right on top of it. I mean, the, the needs of Buffalo seem to make him a, a not quite conservative in the spending sense or, or in the government intervention sense. I mean, he, he did go for transit money and he went for, hmm. you know, UDAG grants and EPA appropriations and stuff like that. He, he was a big government conservative in a but sense. But I think about Everyone was doing that during yeah. those periods. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, confrontation that you have now on the budget issues was there in a macro sense, but never in a micro sense during those years. A um, uh, couple, couple of last questions. Uh, first, what, what, did, what did he read every day? Or what did he, where did he get it, where, besides, I mean, talking to his colleagues, where did he get his information? Well, he got every newspaper in the world. He did. <laughs> every newspaper arrived at our our door. So the Buffalo Evening News, the other Buffalo paper, the, the York, Washington Post, New York Times. New York yeah. Times, Wall Street Journal, and so forth. I mean, at least five papers he would yeah. spend time with. And he carried this vanilla, uh, manila envelope <laughs> along with him every day, and everything that everybody handed him through the day went into that envelope. <laughs> he would just put everything in there. Whether he read it or not, I don't know. But then it would just pile up on his desk. But a know. voracious reader. Oh, I mean, yeah. he books, would, you know. We receive books and you, always have two or three going at the time. We had yes. never enough bookshelves to handle all of his books. So, but his books were economics, uh, history, were history, 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 economics, history. everything. Did he have yeah. certain Classics. favorite books? Well, I, I wouldn't say necessarily favorite books, Anything but he, that he certainly said, you got to read this. He certainly yeah. had his favorite authors yeah. in the sense that you know anything from history to classical economics to whatever. I mean, there's no question. I mean, he did what, in my opinion, very few members of Congress really do, and that's he would often go back to primary source. I mean, you know, so he would be carrying around the great classics, and as John says, when you got a book from him. You know, the marginal comments and so forth, the cross-references in the book, the underlines in the index of the table of contents and so forth. It was just all there. Any, any specifics on this? You mean on any the, books? Which yeah, books? The books that you, that you got from Jack that you stand um, out in your memory? No, I, I, um, I think that he wrote a, 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 a monograph which describes some of his influences. They were sort of the um, conservative greats. Um, um, you mentioned, mentioned some of the Mises and uh, Hi. Um, he, in, at the time of the 1976 bicentennial, he became interested, I think, in, uh, in um, just judging by the, the books that he had in the, in the founding. And he was always uh, a big fan of Lincoln, uh, anything having to do with Abraham Lincoln. 
he became increasingly uh, enamored with. So what was his attitude toward the House as an institution? Did he, I mean, he clearly decided not to go for the Senate. You know, he did run for president, but was, was he a man of the House, would you say? Was he an institutionalist? Oh, I'm not sure of the answer on that. Yeah. I mean, he was certainly a man of the House because it was the only place he served, but, you know, not a man of the House in a Churchillian sense of being willing to be there 62 years or something. Uh, it had been an important platform for him. Uh, he had chosen to do something else, and therefore, you know, after a relatively short period as a member of Congress, he moved on. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, certainly his colleagues from the House remained part of, many of them did, his inner circle for, you know, throughout his life. No question So his about inner that. circle is who? Well, at the time, there was uh, Trent Lott and Newt Gingrich and, um, Dan Coates, um, uh, John, Russolo. John Russolo. You know, it's interesting because Jack had a fairly good number from California, and that reflected mm -hmm. obviously being born and raised in California and so forth, but he knew the California delegation very well, and I think that was a politically a benefit to him. Um, but, you know, you had a number of rising Bill Brock, I mean, Bob you know, people that were already out of the House in some cases, right? They had gone to the Senate. Um, and then many of these colleagues of his in the House had gone to the Senate um, from the period that he had served. So, uh, and governor, but you know, Jack really did maintain good relations with these people. Mm -hmm. uh, and with some cases, it had to be hard won. There was no question about that. So who were the amigos and, and wh what did they do together? I, I wasn't privileged to go to the meetings, <laughs> but I don't know what they did, but. It was Trent and um, Dan Coates and Newt Gingrich, and there's one other that I can't think of. The Connie couple. Mack. Connie Mack, yes, that's mm -hmm. it. And the reason they could be, we called them the amigos because they would want to get together, and uh, we'd call the secretaries. You know, we didn't have email to make these appointments and everything. I have to call all the secretaries, and they Jack liked to eat Mexican food, so I named them the amigos. And I said, let's get the amigos together, and I. All the, all this is how often? How often is it? Oh gosh, so once every two weeks or so, maybe. I'm not really sure. Whenever there was some crisis that they needed to get together and talk quietly. Was there there an amigo chief of staff? Nobody so. was allowed to come to those meetings. <laughs> no, it was closed no. door. I yeah. So do you, did you get feedback? And do you, I mean, do you know what they? Well, this was really started after Randy. Oh yeah, I was already gone. This was right. in the 80s. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're just about done. Um, how do you think Jack Kemp should be remembered in history? And oh, God. I think he should be remembered as somebody that had a substantial influence um, on the Republican Party and by that had a substantial influence on the nation. Uh, I think it is still there. Um, you look today, the very day that we're sitting at this table and the Republican Party and its adherents in Congress uh, and, and elsewhere, you know, we don't raise taxes. You know, we know that for many people in politics, especially in the other party, I'm going to say this partisanly, uh, tax revenue is a form of eating. And so you have to starve them, and you starve them by not giving them more tax revenue, because no matter what they say about wanting new tax revenue to balance the budget, the minute that you start moving toward balancing the budget, they'll be spending crazy again. I don't know that I can elaborate on that other than he's um, a great family man and he loved his country. Can I go first? Um, I think he's probably the, um, in recent history, he's the, the person who did not become president who's had the, the biggest impact on, on policy, on economic policy, certainly. Okay. People are still talking about it. Yeah. Thank you all very much for, for doing this. Thank you. Okay. Uh,